One more, guys. One more time through the heated conversation. Moses and Yahweh talking at the burning bush. If you remember from Monday, let's see if you remember. You've had several days to like, you know, build this rhythm up a little bit. So Yahweh appears to Moses and says, hey, I've heard the cry of my people. I've seen their affliction. I am coming to rescue them. And I am sending you, Moses, to go lead them out. And Moses says, who am I that I should go? And God says, what? I am with you. I will be with you. We saw that it's not about what you can do. It's all about who is with you. And then Moses is like, God, they're going to ask me about your name, your character, what is up with you. And we saw that God pledged a promise in his name, the name of Yahweh, which is that he will be whatever we need him to be, whenever we need him to be it. Then Moses said, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't believe me that I've had an encounter with you? How can I prove that? We saw that God promised both to Moses and to us that he will provide supernatural evidence that we have been with him. And for us, we're not not a snake-handling church. (laughs) Instead, what God is going to bring out of us is indeed the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Supernaturally, turning us into people of patience and of joy and of love and peace and faithfulness and self-control and goodness. Then, last night, we saw Moses, really it's his final excuse that he gives to God. He says, I'm not really good with my words. I'm not a good speaker. God said, I will be with your mouth. And in fact, we saw that God is not just our creator, but he made you and he made you to be you, not somebody else. He didn't make you an accident. He made you on purpose, and he made you to be you. Tonight, Moses is out of excuses, but he's not without one last uh, complaint, if you will. You've seen this whole journey of God, uh, Moses kind of, he's not bartering with God. He's just trying to get out of this gig. And finally, he has just one final card to play, and it's this. Moses said, please, Lord, send someone else. <laughs> Mercy. So God, I'm out of excuses. I've tried them all. Everything I can think of, I've exhausted my list of reasons why I'm not qualified, why I don't want to go and everything else. I just don't have any more reasons. I just don't want to do it. <laughs> So please just send someone else. Because what you're asking me to do does not sound like a lot of fun. In fact, I've got some other plans for my life. I've got this other vision of where my life should go for the next 40 years. I've got ideas of what what my future might have in store for me. I mean, God, don't you know that I've been planning some stuff? Please, just send someone else. Just send someone else. Have you ever said this to God? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, Lord, just please. <laughs> Maybe if it was another time, but not right now. Just find somebody else to do it. Send someone else. This is the moment, the dramatic moment. I wish I could make it do it on the slide, but, but where... That, that burning bush just kind of flares up a little bit. Because then the anger of Yahweh burned against Moses. And he said, Is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? Don't you have a brother Moses? Oh, yeah, yeah. I know that he can certainly speak. If you're worried about your words, your brother sure can talk his way 
well, into trouble, as we'd see later in the story. But we know that he can certainly speak. And moreover, behold, he is coming out to meet you, and he will see you and be glad in his heart. You're worried about people if you come back to Egypt, and nobody's going to be happy to see you. Well, your brother Aaron will. He's looking forward to connecting with you. Is there not your brother Aaron? Because here's the thing. God is angry with Moses at this point. He's frustrated. But God is not frustrated by Moses' need. God knows that Moses is going to need some assistance. God knows that Moses is not able to do this on his own. He's not frustrated by Moses' need. He is frustrated by Moses' lack of trust. He's frustrated. It seems like Moses just won't trust him to provide. Because let's look back at here just for a sec. The anger of Yahweh burned against Moses. He said, Is there not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he can certainly speak, and moreover, behold, he will come. What does it say? He is coming already. God has already called Aaron to come and meet Moses. Before Moses expresses his need for assistance for a teammate, God has preempted that need. He has foreseen it, and he has already been working behind the scenes to make it happen. He is coming already. Because here's the thing. God has designed and destined you to live and work in community. God's plan is not for you to live and work alone. You have been designed for community. The very first thing wrong in the world when God created it Actually, it's before sin enters. Because God looks and he says, it is not good that man is alone because he is designed for community. And not only designed, God does not create a design and then set it up to fail. God has designed and destined you to live and work in community. He's not just going to wire you to need somebody and then turn you loose by yourself, isolated and alone. He's wired you to need somebody else. And he will provide the community that you need to live and to work. Pausing here on this thought, invite you to, well, turn on the screen, turn mentally with me to Paul's letter to the church in Corinth we call 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians in chapter 12. So admittedly, we're parachuting into the middle of somebody else's mail from 2,000 years ago. But this isn't too hard to track with. Paul jumps in. He says, For also by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, by that he means Gentiles, the Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit, for also the body is not, oh, it's now not one member or one part, but many. So there's an element of unity, and there's an element of plurality in the church. Continuing, he says this, drawing on that metaphor of the body. It says, if the foot says, because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body. Paul says, this isn't a good reason for the foot to not be part of the body. The foot can't look at the hand and say, well, I'm not a hand. It must not be part of the body. That's ludicrous, Paul says. Also, if the ear says, well, I'm not an eye, so I'm not part of the body, that's not a good reason for the ear to not be included in the body. 
He fleshes this out a little bit more because, hey, if, if you're just all hands, you can't walk anywhere. If you're just eyes, nobody's going to hear anything, right? I mean, this, this is obvious. This is obvious to us. Community needs you. Community needs you. You do not get to say, because I am not like this person or that person, I must not have a place in God's family. No, you have a place. Nobody doesn't belong. Community needs you. So, if perchance you happen to be somebody who maybe doesn't like to be up front, maybe he doesn't relish the thought of public speaking, or you, if somebody handed you a guitar, you wouldn't know the first thing what to do with it, Amen. <laughs> or if the best you can muster is making a joyful noise to the Lord, but you don't know if anybody else is finding it joyful, That doesn't mean that you don't have a place in the family. Amen. It might mean that you're not called to lead worship. Amen. But there is more to being in the family of God than the really obvious roles of people like me. Because goodness knows, if every part of your body was a mouth, we would be in big, big trouble. Community needs you. In fact, we have limited time tonight, so we're not going to just do a, a full deep dive exposition into 1 Corinthians 12. But if we were to, you would see that Paul says that certain parts of the body that maybe don't get the spotlight as much, they are more valuable and even more necessary. I'll tell you a dirty secret. My job, my role could disappear and the church would be just fine. For too long, the church in the West has relied upon people who do what I do to see that things kind of go together. But guess what? I'm the anomaly in the New Testament church. Everybody who doesn't do what I do, they're the ones who made the kingdom grow. The argument could be made that maybe a few less people like me might be a good idea. But community needs me too, so right. hold on off on that. But there's not a single person in this room who's not only valuable but necessary Amen. for the body of Christ. Amen. Community needs you. So let's keep going here. If they were all one member, Paul says, if they were all the same body part, where would the body be? I really said, if every, every, every part was a mouth, the body would be in big trouble. But now there are many members, many parts. There are all different kinds of parts. But how many bodies? One. one. The eye cannot say to the hand, whew, silly hand, I'm an eye. I don't need you. Or again, the head cannot say to the feet, feet, when was the last time you thought something? I don't need you. Community needs you. And you need community. It is all too tempting for some of us to think that we're pretty self-sufficient. And that we can follow Jesus pretty well on our own. And that we don't need somebody else's thoughts. And we don't need somebody else's fellowship. Especially those people who don't agree with us. Woo. Oh, if, if they don't agree with us, then they can go over somewhere else. I don't need them. And definitely if they don't have my skill set, well, they're, well, at least they're not as important. My goodness. Just as it's ludicrous to think that, okay, well, the eye can do away with the hand. 
or the head can do away with the feet. You don't get to look at anybody else and say, you're not needed or you don't belong. Every single person is not just acceptable in and invited to, but necessary for the family of God. Amen. Community needs you. And you need community. Verse 18, Paul says this, God has appointed the members, each one of them. How many of them? Some of them? All of them. Each one of them. In the body. Is the church supposed to be just like a bunch of, uh, of, of uh, amputated limbs just like floating around the world? No. It is, it, that, that was kind of sorry for that mental image. No. Everybody in the body just as he desired. God has designed you and destined you to live and work in community. And he desires it. This is just, this is just crazy, guys. Because God didn't just wire you to live with other people and to do life with other people and to rely on them where you have weaknesses, lean into their strengths. And when they have weaknesses, you provide your strengths to help bear their burdens. God has not just designed you to do that. And not, he has not just destined you to do it. It's not as if he created this design and then was like, oh man, rats, now I made them dependent on each other. I guess I'll have to provide for that. No, he also desires it. Amen. You need community. Community needs you. Amen. And God has designed you and destined you to live and work in community. And it is his desire that you find your place in it. Like Moses, you might find yourself feeling like you're a bit isolated at the moment and called to something and you don't know how God's going to provide for you community. That's okay. Follow his call and look for the community that he will provide. Might not be exactly what you think. Might not even be what you want. But God will provide community for you because he has designed and he has destined you to live and work in community. And he desires you to be in his family.